Welcome, everyone. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Scott Adams to the program. I think you know him as the creator and cartoonist from Dilbert, but uh, you may not know that he's got a extensive background, not just in economics and banking and as an MBA, but he actually became a trained hypnotist along the way. And I found him on various other podcasts uh, years ago before he ever became sort of an influencer type. I don't know what we call, I'll ask Scott what he calls himself now. Uh, I will tell you, uh, you can find him on Twitter at Scott Adam Says, uh, also on Locals. He has uh, on Reframe Your Brain. I'm going to bring that up again. We come back after this little break. He Reframe Your Brain is his new book. Uh, he says it's his best one ever. Uh, and the Locals community where he gives lots of special um, reframes, amongst other things, and uh, special content is at scottadams.locals.com. He'll be here in just a second. Let's get uh, going after this. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous. I'm a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. I think everyone knows the next medical crisis could be just around the corner, whether it comes in the form of another pandemic or something much more routine like a tick bite. You and your family need to be prepared. That's where the wellness company comes in. You know the wellness company. We have their physicians on like Dr. McCullough frequently. The wellness company and their doctors are medical professionals you can trust. And their new medical emergency kits are the gold standard when it comes to keeping you safe and healthy. It's really, it's a safety net. It's an insurance policy yeah, absolutely. that you hope you're not going to need. But if you need it, you sure as heck are going to wish you had it if you need it. Be ready for anything. This medical emergency kit contains an assortment of life-saving medications, including ivermectin, z -Pak. The medical emergency kit provides a guidebook to aid in the safe use of all these life-saving medications. From anthrax to tick bites, to COVID-19, the Wellness Company's Medical Emergency Kit is exactly what you need to have on hand to be prepared. Rest assured, knowing that you have emergency antibiotics, antivirals, and antiparasitics on hand to help you and your family stay safe from whatever life throws at you next. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC. That is drdrew.com forward slash TWC to get 10% off today. Just click on that link. As I said, Reframe Your Brain is his new book, and he says it's the best one so far, and that the reviews have been over the moon. Uh, find him at Scott Adams Says on Twitter and also scottadams.locals.com. Uh, you can find at Locals and on YouTube every morning. By every morning, I mean every morning at 7 o'clock Pacific, 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. He does a uh, one-hour discussion about uh, the news. Um he, uh, in addition, as I said, has been the creator of Dilbert, though recently canceled, and we'll talk all about that. And I would ask everyone a little bit of patience with us. I'm noticing there's a little more delay uh, in our communication here today than usual. So if we step on each other, apologies to him and apologize to you all, where it seems like we're interrupting, which is a common complaint in this podcast because we do things at a distance sometimes. So please welcome Scott Adams. There we go. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Dr. Drew. So I'll let you go on a bit about Reframe Your Brain. Talk about it, promote it, why people love it. <laughs> so uh, reframes are just simple sentences that put some new code in your head, almost like uh, reprogramming your head. And you can think of them as, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, reframe would be alcohol is poison. Now, one of the things that reframes have that is different than advice is that a reframe doesn't have to make sense. It could just be something that works. So while it's not technically mm. true that alcohol is poison, and I'm not advising anybody to change their lifestyle, I'm just giving options. Uh, if you pair poison with alcohol instead of beverage with alcohol, it just makes it easier to quit. So it's a little yes. hypnotist trick. So it's a book full of things like that from everything from your job to your personal life to your health, uh, et cetera. You, you know, you there like are, it just reminds me of something. 
Yeah, that reminds me of something that um, I was involved with a marketing team once. They were trying during the HIV days to get people to use condoms. And they consulted with, uh, I was actually working with the Trojan people, and they consulted with essentially a hypnotist psychoanalyst who did who had found a way to drill down uh oh i think scott just froze there he is he would drill down to the basic motivational influences on the human brain right and uh, much like you're talking about where you put these little things in that may or may not be sent cognitively directly related to what you know you want people to do in any event i found it fascinating and he did all this testing and studying and he found the one thing most associated with uh motivation to to at least purchase condoms was a six shooter you had to associate it with a, a, a revolver essentially and I, and I was like wow how interesting but it makes sense to me also how that our subconscious brain works which is sort of images and you know motivations and it's not it's not cognitive yeah part of the the strange thing about a brain is i like to think of it as having dangling wires and you can just sometimes mm. take two wires in your brain and connect them and, and it doesn't make sense like the six shooter and and the condoms but if your brain just has a couple of dangling wires and you can connect them then their qualities merge and that sounds like what was happening there. Now, you wouldn't know that without just doing lots of trial and error. I mean, uh, you wouldn't yeah. get there intuitively. You, you would have to just try yeah. a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and and I don't know if you know this about you and I, but I discovered Scott long before anybody else did. I seem to be, I seem to be about two years ahead of the curve when it comes to people who have interesting ideas like i found jordan peterson he used to do these podcasts called maps of meaning and, I, and i'm always looking for new ways of looking at things and thinking about things and at the time he was pulling together essentially anthropology and religion and psychology and i thought that was you know the sort of integrative stuff was very interesting to me and i found you talking about motivation i was like i I don't know anything about that. I've never heard anybody talk about that before. And and how do you get people to motivate? And how do you persuade? That? And I thought, I, I need to understand this. And uh, I, I, you were probably promoting a book or something. You were making the rounds. It was a long time ago. And I was on the Greg Gutfeld show, and I brought you up or something. Somehow you came up, or he brought you up, and he goes, do you watch his his daily Periscope show? I'm like, what? His daily Periscope show? Do you remember you were on Periscope back then? And I, he goes, yeah, I've started watching it. And uh, I, I will tell you most recently, I'll let you respond to this, but most recently I was talking to Greg about you, and he goes, yeah, I think Scott Adams has radicalized me. So go ahead. <laughs> tell us that history. <laughs> You know what, what you remind me, one of the reframes is systems versus goals. So I end up, you know, being a person who talks about things every day and persuasion, but that was never a goal. Uh, uh, my system was I would just test a whole bunch of stuff and never stop, you know, just testing things and see what happens. So the Periscope was a, an app on the old Twitter platform. One day I just said, huh. What would happen if I push these buttons? Am I going to be live to the world? And and I was, except the world was four people. And then the next time, maybe 20. And I, I liked it. And I thought, you know, I think I'll do this again. I like talking to these 20 people spontaneously, just turning it on. And, hey, 20 people. And the next thing you know, it was thousands and tens of thousands. And then here we are. So that, that's sort of how I run my, my whole operation. I try a lot of stuff, see what sticks. And uh, I, I'm, I want to give you a chance to talk about what's different on on your locals platform. What? How, for, go ahead and talk about that. And and then I'm wondering, how do you describe what you do? I, I use the word influencer. I don't think that's quite right. But how do you describe it? And then what's different about locals? Yeah, I'm almost impossible to describe at this point. If somebody asks me for the quick mm -hmm. version, I say author, because yeah, that covers a lot of ground. Authors talk on live streams too. So I, I just go that way. So it covers everything. Um, what, what was, was there a second part of that question? What's going on at locals myself? different that, uh, that, no, no. What's, what's different about locals and what do you offer there? Oh, so locals has my new Dilbert reborn comic, which is the spicier version of Dilbert, the stuff I couldn't get away with in the newspaper. 
Uh, you can also get that on the X platform for $3 just a comic. But if you want the comic, plus my Robots Read News comic, which is about the news, uh, plus my live streams, plus all my other content, then that's on Locals for a little bit more subscription service. All right. Here's what I want to get into. I, I want. I want. I think there are two broad uh, topics I want to get into. One is free speech, uh, but the other, before we do that, um, is this is sort of a a broad idea to start from. But one of the reasons I used to watch you religiously is uh, Donald Trump made me anxious, and I couldn't figure out what the hell that guy was doing. And you helped me understand that and calmed me down. Okay, I would I would actually walk away sort of feeling, okay, I get what's going on. I th I think at least I have a frame, as you say, to understand it. But lately, you've been scaring the shit out of me. You've been you you were you used to talk about the golden age and, and the golden age, and now you're predicting things that I just think, oh, dude, what what do you what? Come on now, <laughs> get me out of this. Don't 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 dig me deeper. So what's happening? Yeah. Well, these are different times. I, I think in times when people are irrationally worried, then my job, I kind of see it that way just as an adult in, in the world, is to calm people down. There's no reason to be alarmed. But if it's the opposite and there's a, a big problem coming, then I'd rather go the other way and say, hey, there's a big problem coming. You better get ready for this right away. It's part of the, what I call the Adam's Law of Slow Moving Disasters. If everybody can see it coming, we're real good at adjusting. And one of, the, one of the big things is, you know, what's happening on colleges and what's happening with the left and what's happening as the children are being trained to uh, have a certain point of view. Uh, it looks real dangerous. And in particular, when I hear people throwing around the word colonizer and I realize that I've been lumped in that group, to me that sounds like a death sentence. Now, I realize that sounds hyperbolic, but uh, you should – if you're on the X platform, follow up Mike Cernovich as well. He's real good at calling out what's going to happen before it happens, and he's seeing this, the same effect. The, the Basically, the way people operate is they have thoughts. Thoughts turn into words, and the thing that happens after words is action, and that's an action word. Colonizer is not just, I'm an academic, I'm talking about stuff. Colonizer is get your pitchfork and your weapon and you know, readjust things and take money from the colonizers and give it to the people who are colonized. So there's a whole lot in that word. And when you see people casually banding it about at a certain age range, especially, that is a gigantic red flag. And if you don't stop that, you're dead. And likewise, immigration, everything is good in the right amounts. I'm for immigration do a good job of it. But if you just uh, allow people in because they want to come in and you've got this broken asylum system, there's no way that can go anywhere except disaster. Um, so those are the things that I, uh, I refuse to make people feel comfortable because they probably need to get a little bit more uncomfortable to fix it. Oh, that's interesting. All right. That, so see, now I feel better. So, so like, what I understand, what you're up to, uh, <laughs> to your point about words becoming action, uh, on, uh, Lex Friedman's podcast, Greg Lukianoff, I sent you that podcast. He talks about how his concern is that the culture of free, of what, you know, a, a culture quickly becomes law. And he was saying a culture of free speech is important, a culture of censorship these are people that then go out and start making the law or start adjudicating the law, and it quickly bleeds into the law if that culture isn't attended to very, very carefully. He's the guy that's the head of, he's been the head of or worked with FIRE, that organization that, that uh, Harvard that ranks so poorly on. He, he's a very thoughtful guy. Uh, but uh, so to, to that point, the, you know, free speech has been, well, what did you think of the Harvard situation, for instance? What, do you, what was your take on that, where the, where the president came on and said, look, we, we allow all, all things to be said here, which, good, I agree with, except that's not been their policy for quite some time. Yeah, the, the inconsistency is the thing that, that uh, jumps out about the Harvard situation. But my, my take is that we've lost free speech. I don't think that's, I think that's behind us. I think it's already gone. And what I mean by that is, you know, back in the 
Thomas Jefferson days, free speech meant the government specifically couldn't take away your freedom of speech. And that's largely still the case. But in the, as a practical matter, the, the way we speak is now online. And it used to be, you know, one farmer saying some crazy stuff isn't going to hurt that farmer too much or anybody else. Now, if you say crazy stuff, everybody's going to hear it. It's a permanent record. You are absolutely going to get punished if you're on the wrong team. So at this point, this is speech close to free. It's penalized if you say anything interesting. So the way I like to say it is you have the freedom to say things that are uninteresting. That's it. Mm -hmm. As soon as you're interesting, somebody's going to kill you because that, that's, that signals that you're an enemy, you're persuading on the wrong team, you know, you're associated with bad people, according to somebody. So, yeah, we don't have freedom of speech in any, in any practical way. If, if somebody wants to say, blah, 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 the Constitution, it's only the government, I get it. There's no argument there. I understand what it meant in the Constitution. I just mean in a practical sense, it's already gone. And it's a function of the internet as well as our division. Uh, you can talk about maybe how you ended up with some free speech, which you sort of have. Uh, and yeah. it, it it's it's odd to me that what's happening with it's doing it used to drive people underground. Now it's driving people into sort of uh, I'd almost call them markets. You know, it's like groups of people that that want certain content and work, want certain products and. And they're sort of, in, you know, they're sort of isolating themselves from other groups. It's very weird. Yeah, yeah. I it feels like uh, we've we've become so bubbleized by the fact that uh, if you say anything, you'll be destroyed. So you got to stick with your team. At least you mm -hmm. get a little safe. That uh, free speech is mostly it's sort of like a prison situation. Right. If you, if you stay with your with your group, you're not going to get in trouble. But if the other group finds out what you're doing, you know, they're going to come after you. So I get like mm -hmm. you said, I've got a little bit more free speech than other people do because I already got canceled. So I can't be canceled in newspapers any harder than I am because I'm already not in newspapers. And if anybody sees my work now, which is way edgier than it used to be, um, their subscri subscribers typically don't complain. They just unsubscribe if they have a problem with it. So I, I've moved to a place where I can kind of say what I want because I've also limited my audience to the ones who are willing to hear it. But is that free speech? It's kind of a, a pocket version of free speech. But take the current situation. Take uh, you know the, the war situation. I don't feel that I could say, for example, balls and strikes the way I normally would. So normally... My brand is that I'll say what works and what doesn't, you know, independent of politics if I can. But when you're in the middle of a war, it's hard not to take sides. And if you don't take sides, you, you're going to pay for it. So at the moment, I'm since I'm pro-Israel in, in this uh, situation and pro-Israel in general, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit silent about things that I might have other ways, you know, both sides that it's like, well, you got to consider this other thing. But at the moment, you really don't need to consider that other thing. Those things are just going to do what they do. You know, our opinions are not really going to change anything that's happening over there. So that, that would be a case where people will self-regulate, probably in a good way. I don't think that's bad. I think a little self-regulation makes sense in this situation. It, it's odd to me, though, how it's shifting the political landscape a bit in the sense that 70% of Jewish folks are Democrats, and now all of a sudden their team is fragmented into a couple different factions. Uh, how, how Do you have any thoughts about how that's likely to play out? Well, if you're talking about the politics of it, is that the question? Well, I, I'm... I just I'm seeing odd things. I have people that used to champion um, certain institutions or certain uh, players out in public, all of a sudden are finding that those players are not on their team <laughs> and and being explicit yeah. about it. And and where are they going to go then? And who are they going to support? How's that going to work? You know, you know what I mean? It's just it's just things seem the sands seem to be yeah. shifting all over the place. 
and uh, it, it's just going to create. I think it's going to create some strange bedfellows. I, I, I mean, I imagine you know people that come out very strong pro-Israeli position, even if they're on the right, are going to get some some people that they wouldn't have otherwise had supporting them. Yeah, I think the uh, the Jewish vote in America and the black vote are really hard to predict this time. Uh, if yeah. If Trump gets a few more gag orders and he doesn't say anything, he's going to be in good shape because <laughs> the only thing that could take Trump out of contention at this point is is anything he says himself. So just gag him up. You know, if you want him to win, just gag him and, and he'll just float into the, the election at this point. His biggest liability is his mouth. That's that's hysterical. That is hysterical. <laughs> or his words, whatever, whatever the case may be. That's funny. Uh, yeah, I I worry. I you know I'm I'm really um, <laughs> I don't know what to think anymore. But I, I'm sort of I I told Megan Kelly a couple of days ago. I said I'm thinking about not voting because I don't whatever happens. I don't want I I want to say I wasn't a part of it. I, I have this very but it, you know what I mean. But but it might it might I maybe something good will happen. I I don't know what to think. I just don't know what to think. Do Do you have any predictions? Well, the prediction I had, which was that the longer Trump was out of office, the better he would look. And I think that's been true. He didn't start any wars and, uh, you know, the border looked better and there was less inflation, although that has to do with event outside of everybody's control somewhat. So I, I think he just looks better and better. And January 6th is as much as it's got people going, I feel like people just get used to anything. And it, it's just going to turn mm -hmm. into noise if we wait a couple more years. It'll just, just be a, a thing you kind of vaguely remembered. And what was it he did? Oh, yeah, they tried to put him in jail. But probably at that point, we're going to say, oh, it turns out that talking is not illegal. And 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 then people will just yes. say, all right, well, forget about that January 6th thing. I guess he was just talking and encouraging people to be peaceful. So we won't put him in jail for that. It was extraordinary listening to the the three entrepreneurs, uh, Shamash and uh, David Sachs, those guys in the All In podcast, talking about how they had been brainwashed by the press and how much admiration they had now for Jared Kushner and what he was able to achieve and how competent he is. And uh, it was really a, it's a the strange thing to sit and listen to them talk about how do you not know how i guess if you've never been the object of a of a report in the press or something you wouldn't know automatically how distorted and phony and and full of nonsense the 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 news and the press is yeah i'm i'm actually working on i just started getting serious about it today actually a guide for people to learn how to um, interpret the news and to know when it's propaganda and when it's news. And wow, would that have been useful a few years ago? You know, for example, yeah. how many people in the general public would know that even if a major news network comes on and says, uh, we have this anonymous source that said that the president uh, strangled a baby in the White House. And how many people would know that anonymous source one? Is almost never true. <laughs> you know, you, you would kind of think, well, it's probably a jump ball, right? Might be true, be not. Yeah. But yeah. you'd have to you'd have to watch a lot of news before you realize mm -hmm. one anonymous source. The odds of that being true are very low. And I think that the, the way they get away with it, because the news would rather have two sources. But if somebody writes a famous book and says they have a source, then the news is talking about the book's claim. So they can get away that you know get away with them doing their own research there, which is clever. You know, Brian Ryan Holiday, the, he's the famous advocate of stoicism. He's made a whole career around stoicism. I actually, I strangely, I got him into stoicism. He, he when he was in college, it's, it's a it's a story. But but he wrote a book huh. when he was, uh, yeah, isn't that funny? He wrote a book called uh, "Trust Me, I'm Lying." Uh, and that book has got to be 15 years old. And in that book, he talked about how he got these 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 r sort of radical or at least um, rampaging uh, websites to write articles on you know where he would give the, he would be the anonymous source, and then he he would then direct ABC News and all the other so-called legitimate 
there it is. There it is. Uh, the legitimate sources, legitimate at that time, news agencies to these apocryphal sources, and it would get reported as news. And he'd say, "See, it's, it's news now. That's it." <laughs> that that's uh, <laughs> doesn't Nancy Pelosi call that the wrap up smear? So the idea is that a politician who wants to plant a story will talk to their favorite reporter. The reporter will say, well, I have a source. I'm not going to tell you who it is. They'll write a story. And then the reporter who gave that person the story will say, hey, it's not just me. It's also in the news. So if you don't believe me, just look at this news story. But it's all comes it's from right the same there. place. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you didn't know that was a thing, you couldn't spot it. But once you know it's a thing, you can maybe look for it in the news. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was, uh, I, I'm doing something on October 28th, by, by the way, you should come. Um, I agreed to moderate a panel with RFK Jr. and, uh, Asim Malhotra in San Jose. So there it is. Uh, it, they, they are, I don't know why I have equal uh, billing there. Cause I really am just going to be in the shadows, uh, just, you know, sort of hopefully, uh, poking at the content and trying to make sense of it and maybe get some discussion going. Um, but it's at the San Jose Pacific center on October 28th. So please do come on up to that. Um, and then we're going, you know, we're going over to Steve Kirsch's house. Who's, a uh, become wildly anti-vax afterwards he has a fundraiser for rfk jr um but i'm just you know i i'm in this stage right now where i'm interested in hearing from all these people these people get silenced they get sidelines i want to hear what they have to say i'm i'm interested in new ideas i you know i is do, <laughs> I don't know what question I really have, except say, is this going to be the the new normal just from now on that you have to kind of be worried every time you have a conversation and you have to be careful and justify everything you do and say? Yeah, well, in terms of the medical stuff, when you're doing it online, is that what you're talking about specifically? I'm just, I don't, you know, it's, it's going to be mostly medical. It's going to be about, really it's going to be about, I think the, I think the entire, what I'm interested in, I think what the entire focus of the event's going to be is, is, ex, is regulatory capture, how regulation, regulation has become excessive and has become populated by people who were in the government and then go over to the regulation side. And so this, there's this incestuous thing going on and it certainly looks bizarre. It look, you know, with the way things have gone recently have suggested that there's something up. And, and then in this particular presentation, we're going to talk about the food industry too, and how that's also been captured. Yeah. You know, I think the most useful thing that the public should know, and it's rarely reported is who used to work, where, who used to be, whose boss, Yep. who has a yep. spouse a spouse that's on the staff of somebody that's important to the story. And if we could map that, you know, if there was some kind of a program where you could say, okay, this person is in the, in the news, you just punch it and the whole tree of connections comes up, suddenly it makes sense. Uh, the, uh, you're almost always going to find a, a money or power connection uh, in all these big stories. There's always somebody who's – some billionaire is backing somebody – who invested in something and their spouse works on somebody's staff. And that ends up being the real story, the story that is almost too complicated to report, but that ends up being more true than what you see publicly. Hey, you're on to something, my friend, in terms of having uh, a useful way of assessing the news and how, how, you know, false is it? This would be a great instrument. My God, if somebody could come up with that, maybe one of our tech friends or something, or there's some way to come up with this. It feels like something that should be able to be carried out, but it probably, you probably need a, you know, a motivated website like Project Veritas or something out there doing it regularly. Well, yeah, and you also need to see the map of the organizations. You know, the uh, the mm -hmm. fact check organizations, the watchdogs, the think tanks, and and it would turn out that you would find that the heads of all these groups, or at least important people on those groups, came from a very specific you know background in politics, and they know the same mm -hmm. thing. And so are they are they operating independently? You know, if there's a fact check, that's maybe a little gray area. Could you de depend on it going the way that their bosses would like it to go, their old bosses? Because mm -hmm. the old boss is the future boss, right, in politics. The last boss is also going to be the future one or the one that gets you the next mm -hmm. job. 
So, so mm. the the biggest thing that I've learned in the last few years is, uh, and a friend of mine said this, and I was laughing when I heard it because I used to believe it too. And it goes like this: It couldn't be true that this whatever is corrupt because that would require hundreds, if not thousands, of people to all be in on it. And, and there's no way that would be possible. There would be whistleblowers, et cetera. And that's just not true. <laughs> it turns out that getting a lot of people to say the same thing that's not true is so simple. They just have to understand that they will make more money if they say one thing than the other. Their entire careers will depend on being on the right page on this question. You don't have to wonder if they're going to be independent. Nobody is independent. Well, in this. And then you say, but wouldn't there be a few people who would still go against the grain? Yes. And they're called nuts and they're dismissed. You saw it with COVID. You see it with climate change. There's always somebody who goes against the grain. So if what you're looking for is those few people who are going to you know, be, the, be the rogues, they do exist. They get dismissed. And if you're wondering why 98% of them you know, just shut up, it's real obvious. Follow the money. Money is so predictive, especially big money. We're not talking small money, right? We're not talking about somebody on a scratcher to win the lotto. We're talking about the whole of your career, right? If you just say yeah. one wrong thing, yeah, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. That, that and so so there's a positive side and a negative side, right? You can make money if you toe the line. If you don't toe the line, you'll not only not make money, you'll lose everything. I mean, you've been the you've been the object of some of this, and we've both been sort of hit with this stuff. Uh, and and it is it is de you know it can be devastating for people. It's so harmful for them. You know, forget their mental health; their their whole family can be affected. It's their livelihood we're talking about, and people do this to guillotine without any concern for what happens to them. So is a the culture there's a culture that says all this is okay and that's the tribe and if you don't stay with the tribe well now you're in trouble and if you really go against the tribe you're in big trouble and if you're a higher if you're working with and for the tribe well now they have a way to get at you and i i think almost you know i, I know the 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 positive of money is very very powerful and that's probably the the place where big money comes in, but I have a feeling that the the numbers of people that are dragged into these things is really more on the negative side, where they where they are fearful of going running afoul of the tribe, running afoul of their employer, running afoul of the culture, and getting being put up on the guillotine. Yeah, I mean it. It definitely is both, though, because if you're a medical yeah. professional, yeah. you're probably thinking. If I say this in public, that's a whole industry yep. that's not going to ask me to a speaking gig where I make my real money. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, uh, and e even when I was in newspapers, cartooning, I was completely aware of what I couldn't say because I knew the business model. I knew know who advertises yeah. in a newspaper, etc. Yeah. And yeah. now I'm free yeah. of those things, but but it was very limiting. All right, we got to take a little break here. Um, uh, I, I again, I saw, I just saw the way physicians acted, and just to push back a little more before I take a break, which was the guys that and gals that do the speaking is a tiny, tiny sliver of the total population of physicians. But it turns out that seventy percent of physicians are employed; they're employed, and so the if they run afoul of the employer, this is a new thing; they're screwed. And, and so, yes, this was. This was, at least I saw how that operated with physicians during COVID. That, that one fact that most people don't know, well, you just said that most most yeah. doctors yeah. have a boss. <laughs> I yeah. never really thought of that because yeah. I, you know, I just assumed yeah. doctor, private practice, but nope, they mm -mm. got bosses. Mm -mm. Oh, yeah. And listen, you go, you you work in the Kaiser system. You're a patient there, which is actually a good system. But imagine how that could run amok. So it's a very comprehensive top. I had a friend that ran afoul uh, of it 
trying to do something very legitimate and, and now he's the toast of the entire west coast for what he was advocating for but he very nearly lost everything for standing up and going here's the right thing to do so that's medicine everybody that's what that's the opioid crisis guys was the best example of that it was it was the physicians that did it the drug companies blew wind into the sales but it was not, they didn't start it they didn't they they weren't the regulatory agencies that perpetuated it they just capitalized on it we're taking a little break when we get back we're going to dis discuss a pew study on women's mental health uh after the break susan and i have been looking for nutrition pack great tasting greens drink for a while and then we tried our friends at paleo valley's organic super greens which is superior to what's out there on the market our friends at paleo valley well they think of everything and they've created what's been called a magical green powerhouse all three delicious varieties Pure, unflavored, strawberry lemonade and tropical contain 23 certified organic, antioxidant-rich superfoods, including the highest quality spirulina. It's also free of cereal grasses, gluten, grains, soy, and dairy, and no added sugars or artificial sweeteners. And what's more, it delivers digestive enzymes, polyphenols, which are believed to burn fat, and eight essential amino acids. Imagine the time, effort, and cost of trying to make this yourself. It's impossible. Head on over to drdrew.com slash paleo valley, and you will get 15% off your first order. All the great products they have there, 15% off at drdrew.com slash paleo, P-A-L-E-O. Fall is right around the corner, which means dry, flaky red skin from allergy season is coming with it. But the best way to take care of your skin is with our skincare secret, GenuCell. You don't need to worry about that puffy, tired eye look or those annoying dark spots or even dry, flaky skin because GenuCell skincare has you covered. Susan and I love our GenuCell products so much, we want you to try our personally curated skincare bundles. It's risk-free at GenuCell.com slash Drew. GenuCell works so well, you can see the results in this unplanned live moment on our show when the Redness Repair Cream repaired my skin in just minutes right before your eyes. Their concentrated vitamin C serum helps keep your skin plump and hydrated. Plus, with their immediate effects, you can see astonishing results in under 12 hours. Quick, effective, and easy. Go to GenuCell.com slash Drew right now to try our bundles and save over 60% today. And remember to enroll in GenuCell's world-class concierge program for additional savings and free shipping. Don't wait. It's GenuCell.com slash Drew. G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash D-R-E-W. These products have transformed my life and Susan's and saved her marriage. Discover the key to oral hygiene, regardless of your current daily dental routine. Whether you diligently brush and floss multiple times a day, or you struggle, you got bleeding gums, bad breath, plaque buildup. This revelation is for both of you. Surprisingly, over 350,000 Americans experience health issues that may be connected to their toothbrush or even caused by it, ranging from heart or blood sugar problems, forgetfulness, digestive difficulties, immune issues, all related to oral hygiene. Scientific studies have shown that a simple switch of your toothbrush can lead to a healthier teeth and potentially save your marriage. Yes. Save your marriage. Our study. We did a personal study. My wife, Susan, hates the sound of the sonic toothbrushes. But introducing the real white sonic toothbrush, of course, also their hydroxyapatite dirty mouth mineral toothpaste by Primal Life Organics, these products have transformed my life and Susan's and saved her marriage. It's much quieter. It's a very powerful toothbrush, but it is quiet and it saved our marriage. So... The Real White Sonic Toothbrush from Primal Life Organics stands out among all other electric toothbrushes I've tried. It effectively eliminates plaque, harmful bacteria, promotes gum health. Get yours and enjoy 60% off at naturaltoothbrush.com slash DREW. And we are back. We're talking to Scott Adams. Uh, you can find him at uh, Scott Adams Says on Twitter and uh, scottadams.locals.com. Scott, be, um, I did not know I was going to discuss this uh, Pew study, so I am extremely um, 
unhappy with myself. Uh, so I'm coming at this from an uninformed position. Uh, for instance, I, I've just read the headlines. And as you know, headlines <laughs> don't mean anything anymore. Uh, but the headline was that 50% of liberal women uh, may have some form of mental illness. Caleb, maybe you can email me that. Oh, it's you put it up, Scott. Maybe I could find that. Um, because I don't yeah, know what they qualified as mental illness. What's that, Caleb? It's, a, it's, in, it's in the email. Check the the prep email from today. And I linked over to. I'm uh, looking at it. I might it. have to study in it as well. Under my head. Well, here, here's the the chart that he had, that Scott had posted. Okay, put it up. All right. Uh, okay, and one of the Pew have a has a doctor or healthcare provider ever told you you have a mental health condition? Wow, that's interesting. Okay, so that's the threshold, uh, and it gets and it's younger, worse, shocking, uh, and as you get older. It's better. Women worse than men. Interesting that, that the moderates actually surprised me more than even the liberal thing, right? Um, and I'm sure people will want to dismiss it as well. You'd be uh, you'd be mentally distressed also if you were putting up with the you know fill in the blank. No, that's kind of not how it really works. Though uh, I would argue that if as you look at the younger folks on that on that graph, it was highly predictable what we were going to have in the younger population as a result of lockdowns. It just they are so dependent on their social environment for their development and well-being that you take that away from them you will end up with mental illness of various types and god knows the um the re the uh, um, educational failures and, and those who are most at risk are the ones manifesting this most significantly and now msnbc i just saw a thing uh, a couple of days ago msnbc is saying oh no these are all myths these are all myths it would have been thousands of dead children thousands of dead teachers if we had not locked down schools and these people are promoting myths no look at the graph look at the graph where do you think that came from yes younger people I mean, it, the mental illness does come on in the 18 to 22 age group, but these are, we are way above our baseline, way. And yes, there's a lot of other things something, going on in the world, but nothing has the impact of something like code. What's that, Caleb? Something interesting about this graph specifically is that this, the survey was from March 19th through 24th of 2020. So this was like right around mm -hmm. the time that pandemic was tank, like going straight up. Like people were very much aware yeah. of what was going on. So it's, it seemed well, like an interesting time for I the bet, survey. I'm, I, I'm I'm going to say it's going to be worse if they did it now. Uh, at least there will be a steeper curve and uh, directing towards young people. Uh, but but um, you put that up, Scott. Uh, what do we do with this? Well, I'll tell you that the tough part about it is there's so many reasons that people might be going crazy. You got more screen time, less less nature. There was a study about how people need to be physically active at least a little bit all day long because we're meant to that. We're meant to be outdoors. That's wrong. But the, the big yep. shocking part was the difference between the, the liberal and the conservatives. And I think that's there's a real obvious, um, let's say, first hypothesis for that. Uh, the, the conservatives, you know, by the time they're 18, let's say, if you're a female, you've got a good idea what you, <clears throat> what you need to do. You're thinking, all right, I'm going to be going to church. I'm going to get married to a nice guy. I'm going to have a family. I'm going to be a mom. Uh, and that's, that's my life. And even if you don't think that's the perfect life, maybe it's not you know, ideally suited for your personality, at least it's a structure. And everybody does better if they've got a plan or a structure, even if they deviate. But if, imagine if you were growing up as a liberal in 2023 and you're a woman. You could be a boy. You could be a girl, you could be non-binary, you could get married, you could have, you don't have to, you could have a, a, a relationship and kids, of course, you could be conservative and do that as well. But you have almost too many options. And there's lots of research that consistently says you give many too many choices, and it's actually really disconcerting. Put on top of that, our food supply is probably terrible, you know, our screens not moving, you know, uh, the pandemic on top of that, give the fake news uh, so much power that it just makes you, you know, crazy every time you turn it on. And I don't know how you could not see this result. It's the most predictable thing in the world. It, it, it seems, yeah, I would think that would be true. And uh, I, I, the, it, it, 
Well, I've got lots of thoughts about it, but I, I just am very concerned. I, I do feel that, you know, humans need close relationships. They need, they need, you know, Freud said this, work, love, and play, right? And without close relationships that are stable over time, whatever that means for a given individual, I'm not saying you have to get married. I know you have, you have issues, about, uh, you have con concerns about that as a model. Um, but you have to have, but you need intimacy of some type. You need closeness, you need, you need caring, you need attunement. You, you need, there's a lot of, you know, brains need other brains and, 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 you know, bodies in space are very, very important. It's one of the reasons screens are so destructive. Yeah. Um, and I just feel like we've you done know, everything let, to get in the way of that. Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing I think about lately, I'm no expert on this, but um, I've had several people mm -hmm. explain to me that they had addictions and they, let's say they joined AA, that yeah. the addiction was sufficiently replaced by the mm -hmm. uh, interacting with the other the members of the group. Yeah, the fellowship. The fellowship. And yeah. that, that is such a mind-blowing reframe in a way that if you imagine that, you know, like a drug or alcohol, the just addictions you could possibly have, and it's matched by just having some time with people every week. Maybe that's everything. Right, right. Maybe that should it, it's, it's, tell us how to fix everything. You can, you can, well, well, yes, that's what I'm saying. But but there but there is something more interesting that that you know I've obviously studied this stuff, which is it's not just the fellowship, it's the it's the relationships you make in there. And the, you know, some of the recovering people will tell me, you know, the coffee the coffee group we have after the meeting is as important as the meeting to me. But but what I have through my study have noticed is the twelve step process is a guided, intimate interaction with another human being who understands you deeply because he or she has been where you have been. So it's it's first, powerlessness, let, let go, get out of your head. Powerlessness is just about, just stop stop thinking you're the center of the universe. Bah. And your brain, by the way, has some proclivities, so you can't rely on it. So let, let go of that, number one. Number two, have some sort of faith, something, some sort of faith in that, that the sun's gonna come up tomorrow, something, some faith. And then the more important part, sit with another human who's had a lot of experience in recovery and talk about your failings, the things you feel horrible about, your guilt, your shame. And that other person just attunes to you and really mostly says, I know, me too. I've been there. I get it. And then one day, you're that person being of service to other people and attuning to other people. That's the, that's the healing process. And it does, it does not only a lot to heal the addiction or regulate the addiction but it regulates trauma and so many people have childhood trauma that go towards addiction so it, it has a you know dual functions and and the research has shown that really whatever you need professionally there are similar mechanisms in this whole recovery thing which is a this empiric model that's been developed that that can be used the same way sort of cognitive behavioral models and dialectical behavioral models and they're all kind of embedded in the steps if you do them certain ways so that's that's my that's my, and by the way, it's free. It's free. This is the thing that drives me crazy. It's free. It's available 24 seven and it's free. And it, and it has an effective, a measurable outcome that's good and it's free. And why would you get in the way of that? Why would anybody object to that? I, I feel like there's some way to reproduce the, the good parts of that without the addiction yes. part for people who don't have an addiction. Yes. And, and I've been trying I agree. To think, how could you or, organize people to make dinner together? Just, you know, a group yes. of 50 people who just decide, well, we'll just always make dinner together, whoever's available that night or something like that. Yes. And then just bond over yes. a shared activity. There, there's nothing well, better for making a friend than a shared activity. No, nothing tops that. hundred percent. hundred percent. You may not remember this book, but th this, this author that wrote this book saw this issue coming. He didn't know this sort of mechanism within it. But he saw what you're talking about decaying. It's a book called Bowling Alone. There used to be bowling clubs. There used to be gardening clubs. There used to be religious organizations. All these things where people gathered and shared together. And we just, and the screens were the last nail in that coffin. You know, I, I never thought of that. But uh, I'm thinking of my mother used to have a Scrabble night. You know, the, the ladies would come over and play Scrabble. Um, yeah. I used to yeah. be, you know, playing tennis with a small group of people, but you know, I yeah. went to laps 
So, yeah, all mm-hmm. of those organized little activities are, are the, the stuff that makes everything work. So you and I, and uh, traveling companion of your choice, and my wife, need to go back to Santorini, and we need to sit and brainstorm on this issue. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, uh, apparently you, you know where I'm going, just uh, telekinetically. <laughs> and the, the know, people so know weird. the story. We, we ended up in Santorini at the same time, but that's not the weird part. The weird part is that when I said I was going to take a vacation, that Dr. Drew actually contacted me immediately and said, is it the same place I'm going? And my first thought was, no, obviously, it's the whole world. What are the odds? And then not only was it the same country, it was like walking distance. Like, How do you explain that? I mean, I can't even explain. Wait, that. you're forgetting a part. You're forgetting a part. We took the same plane from, from uh, wherever we yeah. were in Germany into the island. Like we like two rows That's away right. from each other. How did that happen? It's so nutty. And 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 it's so and, and, and I gotta tell you something. When you said when you said you were going, uh I DM'd you immediately. I, I had a I actually had a chill that came over my body. I thought, oh my god, he's going to Santorini. I just had this weird th- I just thought, wouldn't it be it's too much, man? I I chilled. I had a bodily based reaction. It was weird. Yeah, I know. So there we were in Santorini. <laughs> and a good time. Well, the, there is something about reality that we don't completely understand. I'm, I'm convinced of yes, that, that we just oh, don't know God, how yes. any of this is wired. Uh, oh, my. I, 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 uh, I do think humans share a communication that we don't know about it, it, and when you when you if you've ever sat and been a patient in a therapist's office or done therapy with a patient you will see things go back and forth that just it's just uncanny you can't explain it experiences and things that that uh, people share in a, in a setting like that i i think it was pattern recognition actually like but below your level of awareness like there was some maybe, pattern you maybe. picked up that, that why i would take a certain kind of vacation maybe you picked up that maybe. i don't like the snow so that narrowed it down. There weren't that many places okay. open. So I, I, I and, and I also feel like, so, so this will get a little more penetrating. I think that yeah. you've watched me enough and vice versa mm-hmm. that we have a sense of how the other would think. And if you were going through the process of deciding where to go, we probably just went down the same funnel. My, that's my guess. We, well, we made that, the same decision. That is straight. true. That, yeah. That that rings true to me, but didn't Christina set the whole thing up? So I don't know. I didn't know her at all at that time. But I said yes, uh, meaning, meaning yeah, that good. there's always yeah, lots of possible places to go. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, so let's let's get back on track here. It's not, so although we've we've had an interesting sidebar here in terms of solutions from you know the the, the big problems that you see coming down the, the pike. And by the way, as it pertains to that. Um, you're 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 talking about you know calling people colonizers and oppressors and this kind of stuff. Um, the one thing there's a book in the 50s they tried to figure out how to manage racism. Like what do we do with this this mind virus we call racism? And they finally discovered that they could only come up with one solution, and it and it and it became the title of the book. It was called Contact. You you learn you make contact with people that you have biases against, and you learn that they're just other human, the same as you, same thing. We're all the same, uh, and so contact is is a, a and this is sort of back to the bowling clubs and things. But I'm wondering in terms of this oppressor oppressed thing, is is it gone too far? I mean, I know you were very interested in what Candace Owens put in her back and forth with uh, Megan Kelly today. We can talk about that too. But have we gone too far for contact to be a solution? Well, you know, the real world versus the online world is so different. If you walk down the, the walk down the sidewalk in any major city and you see, let's say, who's going to lunch and stuff, I mean, it's the most diverse place in the world. And yeah. I've never had a like a uh, a racial problem in person. <laughs> I've never had any kind of you know difficulty because right. somebody had a different religion or a different anything. In person, I've right. never had any kind of anything. But it, it lives yeah. this concept online that obsesses us. 
Yeah, I I think that's right. And so it it but it, but to be again to back to well I don't know because people are, are living online so much that even with contact when they retreat back to the online world they they probably remit they got to go back into their their nonsense. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about what you saw with Candace Owens because you seemed. Uh, shocked by what she put on the uh, twitter feed where she was uh well there was a couple of things there was this back and forth with megan kelly about uh her defending essentially uh, people on college campuses to go to express themselves about whatever the issue is and not having a bad impact on their career from then on you know she was like imagine you know if each of us had to toe the line of something position we took as a sophomore in college i mean that's just unthinkable she's right on that front and then she also uh, put up uh, a paper she had to write and a extra credit, extra credit that she was uh, urged and was actually criticized for not going after. Talk, talk about that a little bit. Uh, so the the second one she was she um, reminded me that the paper was uh, she had to I write a paper. I can't this remember, but project. It was Project Veritas. Yeah. So she had to write a paper yes. from the point of view of the New York Times which has some conflict with Project Veritas, but she had to take the New York Times side of the argument. And she asked yeah. reasonably, if it's an assignment, why can't I take either side? <laughs> that seems like a pretty yeah. good question to me. And then she was also asked for special credit or extra credit to get involved in a protest, which might not even be a protest she was interested in. And I thought, this is way beyond education. Uh, this is pure propaganda brainwashing and that was her take on it as well well talk for a few minutes about brainwashing and how it works and how do we un deprogram people that have been brainwashed i i you your your daily show lately has sort of been very steeped in this material it's upset yeah. me a great deal it's made me it's made me think about this a lot more than i wish i had to but i feel like it's a responsibility tell people who may not be regular viewers what you're thinking and what we need to do well i don't know that you can deprogram somebody directly just say everything you know is wrong and you know the, this other side is right if the other side is even right uh, but what you might be able to do is teach people to be critical consumers of information, uh, teach them to spot hoaxes, spot, you know, ops when somebody's just playing an op on you. If you could do that, you could probably get people to the point where they can talk themselves out of their point of view if it's wrong. But short of that, I don't think you could directly influence anybody. Yeah. Hmm. So that's, so that, that's, uh, that's the bad news. People, people are so, so sold on their side that they're really just arguing a team. And I th think they even forgot that they should be reasoning these things out. And, so, and when you've way, been brainwashed, I'm having you, a, yeah. I, 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 I'm going to need to take a break like really quickly here. So if you have a, okay. a plan break, this would be a good time to do it. Okay, go do it. And help me. Do you have, do you have a 10 or 15 more minutes to, oh, to hang out with us? Oh yes, After I do. Break? I'll be right back. Okay. Yep. All right. So Scott Adam taking a break. Uh maybe I will go to some calls here while we're in. Uh let's uh bring up let me see what this is. Uh oh my goodness. Amy Gadala. I think that's what that is. I give her a chance to ask a couple questions. And again, if you want to if you want to ask a question on the Twitter spaces, you just raise your hand there, you twitch hit the uh the mic in the lower left or the request in the lower left hand corner and then be sure to unmute yourself once i call you up amy you're still muted um and sometimes of course yeah there is the our, our famous cartoon that caleb very kindly put together for us amy if you don't uh, unmute that mic i'm going to throw you back into the pool here for a minute i it's unfair i know because sometimes people walk away from the twitter spaces all right she's gone uh josh let's get you up here Hey, Dr. Drew. Hey, man. So um, I just want to talk about narcissism. And I feel like mm. it's such an easy thing to talk about, but it needs to be talked about every day, especially if you're someone suffering from it. <laughs> um, yeah. And it, we sort of live yeah. in that kind of culture. So mm. it's going to be there in some way. We can always get closer to other mm. people, I feel like. And that's you know going in the other direction of narcissism. 
But I think Scott had some really interesting ideas. It's too bad he's not here because I think what he's talking about is that a lot of this is sort of unavoidable. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but and it's kind of healthy. Mm. There is a healthy narcissism. There is a way to be. Yes, there is. Um, there is a way to be communal with other people, and if other people call you narcissistic and you're doing well and you're then screw them because they don't know what they're talking. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yes. and I think you've, you've, you've told me that before. There's a healthy narcissism, you know, for the fighter pilot, for the surgeon. And, um, I think it's really hard every day to try to separate those two things out. And, and am I being narcissistic in what I really love to do? Can I be better? I feel like we can always be right. better. Maybe you can comment on that. Yes. Well, I, I would say, Josh, it, it is the, the mitigating factor is very much what we were talking about with Scott, which is other people, right? Uh, it, it very, very few people actually have narcissistic personality disorders, right? And, and a true disorder, it, when, you have, when you have full-blown narcissism, it's almost impossible to function in a relationship. Because when other people have needs or their needs run directly afoul of yours, you don't care when you're a narcissist that you, you lose track of people's feeling states and you really don't care. And the, the, and, and those people are not treatable because they see the whole world as the out there is the problem, not the in here. When of course this is the problem. People with narcissistic traits can have all kinds of different uh, variations on a theme. And that's really what's going on these days is that so many of us have these narcissistic traits, had some childhood injuries of various type, and it, it's getting amplified by the current environment. That's what I find most troubling as opposed to something that would de-amplify it which would be what Scott and I were talking about, uh, clubs and that sort of thing. Hey, Caleb, uh, you're going to let me know when Scott is available? Yes, I was just about to prompt you. He's, he's back now. Okay, so we'll bring Scott back in here. Yeah, people are interested in what we were talking about in terms of uh, getting relationships going. It's, it's interesting to me that, that, that uh, somebody would bring that up right away. And it, 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 it you know, I... My, my paper is on narcissism, I noticed, because I get notifications when academics are reading them. or are getting read all the time now. This is a paper I wrote 15 years ago. And so people are sort of getting the sense of what's going on in terms of, you know, the, the personality styles of our time. Uh, I, I think you and I are on to something there in terms of, you know, gathering and groups and community and relationships. I, I just think that's... It's almost always the solution. That's you know even when you look at uh, mythology and you know the uh, the first uh, epic uh, poem is a poem called Gilgamesh from Sumeria or something, and even in that one at the end he goes on this crazy tour and into the underworld and whatnot, and at the end it's very much like uh, Candide you know from Voltaire at the very end the the he's talking to somebody and they go what'd you learn from your trips and he goes, well. It's important to go serve your community, return to your roots, go serve your community. And Voltaire summarized it as it's a, you must cultivate your garden. Just go cultivate your own garden. Is there is that is that good advice for the present moment or is it so unrealistic because of uh, social media and whatnot? You know, I'm, I'm really liking um, Arnold Schwarzenegger has a book called Be Useful. And I've heard Jordan Peterson that. say the same thing. And, and I've said that in yeah. my past books as well. In fact, I've often yeah. used that to summarize my entire philosophy, Be Useful. Now, yeah. I don't know how universal this is. I think it's a little bit universal. But for me personally, it wouldn't be sufficient just to hang out with other people. I, I would have to know that my contribution to my group was substantial and then i can feel good about myself so in my current situation being single at the moment um my attentions are you know how can i make the world better it's a weird thing to wake up and think well what can i do that would like make somebody's life a little better or ideally multiple people so i so i have the advantage of doing that online and then people tell me oh you helped me lose weight or i quit drinking or whatever and i feel yeah. amazing it's like I did that. Yeah. So th there is a way to connect on online if you're being <laughs> useful. But short of being useful, you're not really getting the, the whole benefit there. Well, I, I, I actually agree with you. Uh, and, it, it, the, you know, uh, I, I didn't know we were going to get into philosophy today, but Aristotle actually said the same thing. He said he, he had this term called eudaimonia, uh, which was 
translated in this country as happiness, we probably got that wrong. He meant more like flourishing or, or thriving. <coughs> Excuse me. And he started to figure out what things humans need to really thrive. And he, he thought friendship was a key ingredient in this. Oh, goodness. <coughs> I'm now having a reaction to something. Excuse me here. <coughs> it happens to me in this room once in a while. <coughs> Okay, I'm back. I just needed some water. <coughs> How embarrassing. But he he then said, you know, to to really be thriving, it's it's something it's it's like you said, be useful. It's a service, right? Be useful. But he said really to be really useful, he added a couple things that I think we leave out in this country or in our culture, which is you need skill so you, you, in being useful, you've always been a, a, a persuader, you know, a hypnotist, but you develop, you've developed some more skills through being a cartoonist and now delivering these podcasts. And it, that's a skill. You've delivered a skill, and that is, helps you be in writing books and whatnot. That helps you be eudaimonic, be, be of service, be of useful. And the other thing is wisdom. He called it phronesis or wisdom. And that is experience really at its core. And certainly you've had plenty of experiences lately and through your lifetime to sort of have a, a something to offer people. Does this ring true for you? I'll tell you, especially the age part. The, the things that I didn't know at 20 that I can navigate easily yeah. today, uh, it's, it's yeah. amazing. And if you work with anybody young, uh, just say learning a new job or something, you forget how much you didn't know at the age mm -hmm. of you know 21 or whatever it is. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's just a tremendous advantage of seeing lots of patterns in life. So when a new one comes up, you go, ah, I've seen that one before. I know how this, this movie ends. It's a, quite an advantage. So I, I like to write books that can transmit those patterns to other people so that they don't have to wait as long to figure it out. That's good. That's the wisdom part. That that is the wisdom and experience thing. So just to wrap things up, you've been very kind with your time, and and we've um, you know been oh reframe your brain. Of course, is part of that wisdom and part of that uh, giving forward. I I want to just finish up with more brainwashing because you you've been um, deep in it. Um, is it is the reason we're brainwashed the the news the press the way it has sort of um and we could you know there's a whole history to how we got here i mean i i understand that the 24-hour news cycle was impossible to fill and all of a sudden we're filling it with talking heads and opinions and then it started uh developed into sort of camps that were chanting to their camps and then trump derangement kept in did you by the way invent the term trump derangement because that now is part of our common lexicon no, but I was an early adopter, so I, th I think I helped popularize it. But no, I, I think I think okay. there was a Bush derangement syndrome before that. Okay, so so in spite of the fact that our history makes sense and how we got here with our news, is that what's responsible for so much of the brainwashing? Is is uh, David Sachs and Shamash correct that it was what they were being fed that that gave them their opinions and that they were not being uh, these smart people were not being objective about what they were being fed? Our our opinions are provided to us. We have the imagination, the the impression that we have free will and we come up with our own opinions because we did our own research and stuff like that. But you will rarely, if ever find somebody who has a strong, uh, informed opinion about politics that doesn't identically match the news source they're watching. Now, that's not a coincidence. <laughs> you know, some of it is, mm. you know, there's a little selection bias, of course. They're selecting things that are more likely to them. But when you look at the exactness of their arguments, mm. the, you know, if they're ar debating, yeah. it'll be what a, what a pundit said, what Jake Tapper said, what Hannity said. Yeah. And it's really obvious if you're a hypnotist that it's just a verbatims now. But I think the big problem was we gamified it in a way that wasn't possible before. So before, mm -hmm. if you had you know a disagreement, maybe you discussed it over dinner, but if you're smart, you didn't talk politics over dinner. But today mm -hmm. I, I get up in the morning and I'm like, game on. Who, who dares mm -hmm. say something that I can mock today and, and that I get a dopamine hit. So I'm literally mm. addicted to conflict. Now, you know, yeah. I keep it in perspective. So to me, it does feel like a game. So I don't take it too seriously. I'm not going to hate somebody who disagrees. But I think most people 
kind of get carried away and and the game becomes real. And the times mm-hmm. that I debate with somebody who has a, let's say, opposing view, and it doesn't really sound like they're even doing something like a debate. They're just, you know, throwing little grenades and yeah. getting little dopamine hits yes. from every, like, like clever thing they said. So it's just a dopamine gamification situation. In, in- is there any advice for how to manage that? Because you obviously can't have an argument uh, or a discussion even. Is there, is there a strategy here, a system? Well, honestly, if I didn't do this sort of as, you know, for a living, <laughs> I wouldn't watch the news. I, I think it's mm-hmm. so destructive because it's designed to get your, your energies thinking about something that you can't do anything about usually, and you're mm-hmm. really worked up. Mm-hmm. So. Um, I don't know about you, but I've had to take a number of little short uh, media vacations during the the Israel Hamas situation because I can't handle mm-hmm. it. Like my uh, like mm-hmm. I can feel my brain is is just not being healthy anymore, and I just I got to pull back for a little bit. But th- it's like that all the time for the people who are online every day. Yeah, I, I had a conversation with my son yesterday who's in his early 30s, and he was like, you know, is, is, uh, you've always been able to see the wars this way or quite, you know, see the from the perspective of the person perpetrating these things and all. And I said, not only that, listen, w- during World War II, you would sit in a movie theater once every couple of weeks and see a news reel. Somebody with a film camera filmed something, brought it back physically to an editing bay, and somebody voiced over and talked about it and edited it and decided what you were going to see. I mean, that's where you got your news. Then you got your nightly news, well, and somebody had a video camera uh, and would bring that back and edit it and look at it and transmit it. And, and then the 24-hour news cycle just poof, blew everything up, and then then obviously we're, we're watching in real time with the internet. True. But there's always that step where somebody in the military or the CIA tells you, you can show this image to the rest of the public. I mean, everything you saw in a newsreel was just pure propaganda. They, they didn't show you any mm. limbs falling of off or anything like that. It was just right. America. Look how easy, easily we're winning. Yeah. You know, it's a war, yeah. but it's kind of fun at the same time. <laughs> I mean, that's literally <laughs> right, what people right. were told. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Uh, Caleb, you trying to j- jump in? Here? Yeah, I just I just wanted to point something out that I noticed earlier uh, today. I went to four of the top news websites just being curious mm. about how they suddenly changed direction, just following what is most profitable and getting the most clicks. And I just went down their front, their home pages and I just searched the word Ukraine. And all of them except CNN had zero mentions of Ukraine at all on their home pages. CNN had one mention of Ukraine on their homepage this morning. They all moved immediately mm. over to this entirely different news story as if nothing is going on in Ukraine and Russia right now. They've moved on. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see nothing here Nothing to see here, buddy. Yeah, it's it's, it's it hard when you, you realize what... Yeah, when you realize that the things that you thought were most important are only because they told you you think that's the most important. If, if Ukraine had just not been in the news, well, I'm not sure I would have even put it in my top 10. Even if everything was happening the same way, I just didn't hear about yeah. it. And nobody told me it was the end of the world. I'd just go on with my day. It's like, well, that's too bad. I wish that wasn't happening. But uh, yeah, wow. so now we're, now we're told that the Middle East is our number one thing. And maybe it is. Well, uh, Scott, it's always fun to spend a little time with you. I appreciate you being here. And um, like I said, we, we've we've, we've brought, we've walked into some really interesting territory today that uh, suggests solutions. And I particularly this idea of how to get people to operationalize sort of a 12-step style relationship or community or something where we can bottle that and get people to use it a little bit. I, I mean, I suppose... To be fair, religious organizations have been using things like that forever. It, it, you know, twelve step came out of religion to some extent. Um, so I don't know. Maybe this. I don't know. I, I again, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. I don't have a clear head on it yet. Any last thoughts you want to give us before I let you go? Well, it's a big old crazy world, and uh, I, I would give everybody <laughs> advice to take a break from the news. You know, as I said earlier, um, I I'd also say that. I've been trying those uh, Dr. Huberman techniques, you know, where you, you take mm. two breaths, two inhales, and one exhale. Oh, my God, does that work? Yeah. 
Like I didn't think yeah. I didn't think you could immediately feel it, but you do. I've also been trying grounding. I'd love to know if, if that's real. Where you take your shoes off and you just walk on the dirt and you know, oh, somehow right. it corrects you electrically. Uh, I've been going out in the morning looking at the sun before 10 a.m. when I can. That's another Dr. Huberman thing. This stuff works. Mm-hmm. It's, and, and I've also cut out sugar and eating bread. and My body feels terrific. If your body feels terrific, the mental stuff's a lot easier to handle. So take care of your yes, body. Yes, it is. I've been doing it. Get some sun and get some friends. Thank you, sir. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Dr. True. You got it. Uh, and let's, Caleb, throw up the schedule for upcoming guests. Uh, we have uh, tomorrow, we have Dr. Michael Turner with Dr. Victory, of course. Carrie Lake, uh, we've been on and off with Carrie, but I think she's back on again for sure. And then uh, Caleb has a baby coming. There's the baby. <laughs> it really is a countdown now. Uh, that baby looks like it's actually out of the womb. That that sonogram is so good. That's so uh, nice October 25th, everybody. 3D, 3D sonogram. I know. Now. I hope she it's comes amazing. In. She, we even did one that was 4D. Sooner. It would have cost me, I think it was 80 bucks per photo for a 4D one. I was like, eh, we'll stick with 3D. I don't need a fourth dimension of this kid. We'll what see her 4D? soon. Uh, I don't Gravitrons? Know. It, I mean, what is 4D? It's it was like, like so a much ridiculous. clearer image that they were trying to upsell us to. I was like, eh, I'll pay oh, for 3D. Really Maybe crazy. not. We don't need this fourth dimension, guys. All right, so we um, are going to have no show for the week of 24th to 31st. Uh, Susan and I will be in uh, Florida that week, uh, right? Am I correct on that? Are we getting this all? Yes, this is this week and then uh, that week. Uh, the 23rd, are we going to do callers on that day? There might I know that be was a, a possibility. I'm not 100% sure about that. There might be a I would guest say that comes that, in. That's probably it. Oh, to do it for me, like Kelly? I'm not exactly sure because the schedule is changing. No, I'm pretty sure that one is a, a, a no. Unless, what I do know, mm, what do you know? What I do know is that so on November first, November second, November third, because that's at, right after the baby's getting here, and I will probably be on like yes. maybe an hour, half an hour of sleep each of those nights. We're going to be doing a special yes. week of callers only shows. So we're going to start out. The Correct. plan right now is to start November first. I'll show all about with calls. Everyone line up your calls for anything about COVID yep. vaccines, medical freedom. Then November 2nd, it's going to be mm-hmm. callers without anything except COVID. No COVID calls, everything okay, else. Fair enough. Then November Excellent. 3rd, it's going to be an ask me anything, any topic, ask, call in and ask Drew anything. So it's three caller shows. To get all your it. questions in. I dig it. Um, now the 23rd, I, the only way we could do the 23rd is if we go to the local, we're going to be in Miami or something. Uh, if we go to the local studio, which I am doing the next day with Viva Fry, I will be in the local studio with him on the 24th, but I don't think we can pull that off on the 23rd. So let's just All say right. for now, we're not doing that. Okay. Yeah. We'll uh, that. So we're off that week. It's a baby week. Uh, we do get to take weeks off here and there. And that is one of them for us. Uh, do follow us, uh, Dr. Drew on TV and at ask, ask Dr. Drew on Twitter and whatnot. We appreciate you being here. Then do please support the people that support the show. We are so grateful to have the people that support the show that we do have. Um, have very strong feelings. I was watching the. Um, the uh, paleo, well, the paleo valley. Of course, I love their stuff. But the uh, oh, help me, Caleb. I'm primal life on the, t- the primal life, primal yeah. life, and uh, I cannot tell you how true everything I said there was. Somebody, oh, you know, we put it in the copy for the upcoming commercials. And my son's new, uh, and and he's engaged. His his fiance was uh, sitting with us. Uh, in Orange County, and she goes, look at your guy's teeth. It is so white. She was like, aha, see? This is primal life. It's like she gave him a whole spiel. So uh, we do appreciate them and all of our sponsors. Dr. Ecom's best slash sponsors for the special discounts that we provide there. Appreciate y'all being here. We will see you tomorrow at 3 o'clock with Dr. Kelly Victory and Dr. Turner. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. 
If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. Did I describe my reaction, my lightweight reaction to you guys on this show? Uh, yeah, is that yeah. when you smoked and yes. then you had like a panic attack, right? It was not a panic attack. I had a, what's called an anticholinergic delirium. Mm. I actually had no, I had no anxiety what? at all because I, I, I was very cool about it given how miserable I was. So wait, and what? I had no high. I was just miserable. I, I um, took two hits with some of the cool kids and I developed, I looked like you. That's rough, bro. And I kid you not. The greater the financial interests in a given field, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Wow. The world that the greedy want to create, all of natural resources in their hands, all of land in their hands. The same billionaires who are telling the farmers, forget the land, take money and leave it, want that land. The same people who say, oh, food is unnecessary, we're going to make lab food, are the very people who are then also investing in land to have real food. So many of these different government agencies and how they are involved with our life and where they have gone off the rail by involving themselves with these corrupting influences. Uh, this merger of state and corporate power where the companies that are in industries that are being regulated are capturing the agencies that are supposed to regulate them and turning them into predatory organisms against the American people. 